The latter half of that, you notice how slow it got? That we put what's known as a, a New Orleans drag beat to it. And didn't it just sound like the slow procession mm -hmm. to the cemetery that takes place in the New Orleans funeral? At which point we could have gone and go, one, two, and we could have gone out into the more modern day jazz type piece that you would find in a contemporary New Orleans setting. Anyway, just thought I'd point that out. That was actually an improvised solo by John, so. Very cool. Only musicians can do that. 
I'm prejudiced, but I love my role in life. Okay. Another interesting story. The Confederacy got clever, however, and they needed to move troops in the night. So they'd have the band set up and start a concert. And so the Union generals and leaders would be going, oh, they're having a concert over there on the other side of the hill. We can just relax and listen to their concert. So the band's playing, and meanwhile, the entire rebel army is packing up and moving someplace else, leaving the band behind as a decoy. Now, I don't think this worked too many times, probably, but it did nonetheless happen. The bands provided moral and inspirational support, but they also did serve as corpsmen. Uh, it was not uncommon at all for, at the end of the day, when they would go out on the, the battlefield and retrieve the injured and the dead, a lot of that fell to the musicians to do. And a lot of the musicians got good at uh, helping the medical staff I read stories of musicians learning to amputate limbs, etc. They were they were pulled into the service in that way. Um, they actually also did have to go into battle. And I love this quote. This is from General Sheridan. Now, Custer would often take his band with him into battle, and he'd set them up just out of slightly out of harm's way. But as the battle was going on, the music was actually playing. What a strange experience that must have been. Sheridan, at one point, called on the band to inspire the troops. And he said, you guys are going to go into battle with the troops. And he gave them this admonition. And I quote, I'm going to read this. I don't want to get a word wrong. Play the gayest tune, have them play the gayest tunes in their books. Play them loud and keep playing them. And never mind if a bullet goes through the trombone, or even a trombonist. Just keep playing. <laughs> In the musical world, the trombone is extremely, and John, don't quote me on this, but the trombone is extremely unfairly maligned. It's kind of like the red-headed stepchild of the musical family. <laughs> With, I mean, jokes like, uh, what do you call a car with a pizza sign on the top of it, driving down the street? A trombone player? <laughs> or something like that, see? Anyway, there's a, the trombone players are unfairly picked on, and I don't want to start with General Sheridan or whatever. But anyway, that was... They actually sent the poor guys into battle. And I know that sometimes it was dangerous duty to just remember the over-the-shoulder sax horns. It was not the best duty in the world to be the first one down the country lane. Seriously, it wasn't, it was a, it was a scary place to be, the front of the entire call. Because if somebody was laying in wait in ambush, the first thing that would go would be. Everybody together? The trombone. The trombone. <laughs> okay. So the war ends. You have all these musicians in their brass instruments. And they all head home. And they resume normal life in their communities. Now, rather than having Janissary bands in town, which played some of the older Europe, European, uh, I don't want to say more sedate, but I'm going to. Some of the older, more sedate music, these young men came back from the war, obviously full of energy. It must have been of such a relief to have that over and to be behind them. So they came home with these instruments and all these up-tempo tunes and all this inspirational aspect of their music making. And it actually, some of it, like the Shottish that we just played, a lot of those tunes turned into what was, became known as a two-step, it was a quick-step dance. It supplanted, it surpassed the waltz as being like the dance of the day. It was more energetic, it was 
more powerful. It doesn't take very long for that more energetic and powerful music. The rhythms started to get a little bit more herky jerky. They become what we refer to today as ragtime. That's where the term ragtime comes from. It was these tunes played with a more raggedy rhythm. Hence the term ragtime music. So there's a real evolutionary stepping stone between the Civil War and the advent of jazz. And that would be all these energetic young people in the brass bands that returned from the war. But remember, at the same time that they came back and did this, all those people who played clarinets and flutes and all those other instruments seriously said, wait a minute, I want to join the party. And they did. And it became more common to have a full complement of instruments than it did just brass instruments. But during the Civil War, it was definitely all about the brass instruments. 